Hi everyone, this is Matt Berkowitz of the Zeitgeist Movement Vancouver Chapter and one of the Global Lecture Team members for the Zeitgeist Movement. In this talk, I'm going to recap and respond to a video lecture I gave entitled How to Know What's True, Assessing Scientific Research. This was posted to the TZM official channel on June 2nd, 2014, and has created some controversy amongst certain groups and individuals. Some individuals even called for its removal though the Global Chapters Administration of TZM came to a consensus that the video was relevant to TZM's interests and should remain on the channel. Additionally, I have been asked by numerous TZM members to do a response video addressing various concerns. This is being posted on the Vancouver channel rather than the Global channel since the target audience is more membership-centric. The format of this talk is as follows. I will recap what the talk was about and why I gave it, and I will discuss some of the most prominent criticisms I've received, both the reasonable and unreasonable ones. This will include criticisms about the way I presented the material and specific criticisms of the content. Along the way, I will be bringing on various TZM members who understand the video, who will share their perspectives and insight. Now, I may be accused of cherry picking who my guests are since they will all be generally supportive, but I needed to resort to people who are quite familiar with some of the topics I addressed, who have taken the time to assess my sources and the topics I addressed in a balanced manner. So let's start with why I gave this talk. I designed this talk to encourage people, first and foremost, to become public intellectuals, to hopefully raise the standards, the standards of evidence that people demand for their beliefs, both within TZM and overall in society. For a while now, I have noticed a strong correlation between a certain portion of TZM's membership and the tendency to promote dubious information. This is very understandable to me. TZM questions the very core of our culture, being about as anti-establishment in this sense as possible. We advocate transition from that of a growth economy to a steady state, from a competitive base to a collaborative based system, and from a scarcity based to an abundance generating system. So it is understandable that in an organization that essentially promotes total opposition to our socioeconomic system and our values, that there will also be a tendency to reject so-called mainstream science and embrace alternative dissident positions regarding issues like health, agriculture, uh, drugs, and so forth. Most of these positions are indefensible in my analysis, and I tried to provide some food for thought for people to be able to go about assessing scientific research in a more rational, skeptical manner. That being said, I immediately made it clear in the opening of the talk that I encourage scrutiny and skepticism. In other words, don't take my word for anything I claim. In no way should this be perceived as something I'm imposing. Research the claims for yourself, and arrive at your own conclusions. I also provided a full transcript for the talk, along with a full reference and source guide, and an errata section, so that anyone could email me regarding potential errors I may have made. You can find the link to this in the video description of the talk I gave, or in this talk. It's on the official TZM blog. Furthermore, just because I claim something in a TZM-associated manner, doesn't mean that, quote, TZM officially embraces what I say. And likewise, just because Ben McLeish, Jim Phillips, Peter Joseph, or anyone else claims something, doesn't mean that they represent TZM's official position. TZM is about a train of thought. That train of thought is the scientific method for social concern, which means that our official position on any matter is that which reflects the best evidence available, not what any single person says. I do my best to come to a balanced, skeptical, near-objective evaluation of the evidence based on my critical faculties, and I invite everyone to challenge anything I claim or that TZM claims. The examples I used to substantiate my points were intentionally chosen to ruffle people's feathers a little bit. I didn't want to use safe examples of science denialism or science illiteracy, such as creationism, flat earthism, or faith healing as most of the audience would likely have no problem with them and wouldn't challenge people to enhance their critical thinking and science literacy. 
I wanted to use intentionally socially controversial topics to get people to think a little more skeptically about many of these claims, ranging from climate change denialism to anti-vax and anti-GMO claims. These are hot topics within activist communities, granted, but they are not controversial within the scientific community. And this needs to be understood. If we want to be taken seriously as a movement by respected scholars, scientists, and other experts, skeptics, and ultimately the population at large, our image must communicate that of presenting the best available evidence on these topics. It does nothing but a disservice when TZM communicates, quote, the scientific method for social concern, but also the promotion of chemtrails, alternative non-evidence-based medicine like homeopathy, anti-vax, anti-GMO, and so forth. If that's not clear enough, and you think the information I presented in the talk is in no way relevant to TZM and the efforts to spread awareness about a resource-based economy, let me clarify. TZM generally advocates the application of the scientific method for social concern. This means that the very best evidence must inform how our society is structured and the decisions that are arrived at that affect our well-being. If we want to be part of a movement that advocates science at its core, we absolutely must understand how the scientific method works, not just in theory, but also in practice. So this talk I gave was designed largely to inform people about how to navigate scientific research as it exists today, what steps to take when researching scientific claims or topics, and how to avoid falling victim to the many errors people make when engaging this research. So that generally sums up the goal of my talk and why I thought it was needed. Let me now go into the criticisms and try to bring some clarity to these many issues. First, I want to ask those who disagree with the talk, or elements of it, this question. Are you familiar with the systems of analysis put forward in the video, or are they new to you? If the latter, what is it that you object to? Have you actually reviewed the sources used in the talk? The bulk of the talk was to provide a system for assessing scientific claims. If you disagree with it, what do you think is a better method? So far, I haven't received any constructive criticism as such. Some people have claimed that I don't understand the extent to which cultural bias infects scientific evaluation. But these people have missed the entire point of the talk, which I decided to do partially because it's so difficult to know how to assess research in this monetary culture we live in. I even provided examples in the talk about the degree to which scientific misconduct occurs. I simply cannot understand this claim, therefore, given that the scope of the talk was to address exactly this. This is usually followed by another claim. Some people claim that I place too much weight in what the scientific consensus has to say about a particular topic, that it can be manipulated, distorted, and corrupted by business and political interests. Let me say this. No one who has a thorough understanding of how the scientific process would uh, works would make this claim. I defined scientific consensus in my talk, and I will do so again here. It is, quote, the collective judgment, position, and opinion of, this, of the community of scientists in a particular field of study that emerges once enough evidence can justify a particular position or conclusion, end quote. I provided several prominent examples in the talk about how business and political interests have attempted to distort science or rather the public perception of science, such as with Big Tobacco trying to distort the scientific consensus that smoking was a risk factor for lung cancer, or Big Oil trying to obfuscate the scientific consensus that human activity is responsible for climate change. It's important to note that while these efforts were largely successful in misleading the public, they have failed at altering, at altering the scientific consensus for these issues showing once again the beauty of the self-correcting, bias-mitigating process of science, even in the face of corruption. Keep this in mind when considering people's claims that, say, the biotech industry has distorted the scientific consensus on genetically modified foods. If big oil failed, and its corporate constituents Exxon, Chevron, and BP, each worth $395 billion, $215 billion, and $150 billion, respectively, could not buy a a scientific consensus, what chance does a company like Monsanto at only 57 billion have? Let's keep this in perspective. 
there's a lot more that I could say on this uh, that will likely come up in my interviews, so I'll just leave it there for now. With that said, let's start with the objections I've received with the way I presented the information. Some people took issue with certain word choices I used, such as the words crank, quack, and denialist. Indeed, I was fairly assertive with these word choices. A crank is someone who thinks dogmatically and promotes unsupportable or pseudoscientific beliefs, very simply. Whereas a quack refers specifically to such people promoting unsupportable medical claims. A denialist is quite literally what it sounds like, someone who denies information, usually for the sake of some ideologically and or emotionally driven reason. Furthermore, author Michael Spector defined group denialism as, quote, when an entire segment of society, often struggling with the trauma of change, turns away from reality in favor of a more comfortable lie. While these might sound like dismissive terms, I simply find them to be honest. We use labels every day as short forms to describe a particular idea in brief. To quote neurologist Dr. Stephen Novella, I often discuss various categories of people who are failing in one or more important ways to apply critical thinking. These categories are not meant to be dismissive, but rather to help understand various styles of thinking that lead people astray. End quote. And once again, the choice of language was deliberate to get under people's skin and challenge beliefs. It might not be other people's personal style to use such terminology, and I can understand it, but this is my personal style, and I've seen it work well on the whole. My personal influences and favorites in communication tactics would have to be the likes of people like Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, and Sam Harris. They are blunt, pinpointed in their discourse, and assertive, but almost always respectful. While it can alienate some people, I find that those people are the ones who aren't possible to reach no matter how reasonable you are with them. People who are receptive to evidence often need a more assertive delivery of the information to get them to change, and as such, speaking directly and honestly, but still very respectively, often tends to work. I know it does with me if the evidence is compelling against a position I hold. On the other hand, I can certainly understand that perhaps it wasn't the best choice to speak in such a way for the purposes of this talk. And perhaps I could have avoided some portion of ensuing controversy had I omitted such language. Ultimately, I am for a broad range of communication tactics as they relate to different audiences. And I can see the appropriateness of both the more assertive, unabashed, but still respectful style, as well as the more toned down, ultra compassionate style, and everything in between. We just need to know how to adapt for different audiences. I'll get back to this point shortly. The next claim I want to address is as follows. You're alienating many members who don't align with some of the specific positions you take in this talk, such as anti-vax and anti-GMO advocates. This is a tricky and potentially delicate issue to address. Without getting into these two scientific issues, though I will a little later, the goal certainly wasn't to alienate though I do grant that this will be a symptom. As mentioned, I've noticed a fairly strong tendency for TZM and any social change advocates, really, to fall victim to completely unskeptical, uncritical, ideologically motivated beliefs, ones that seem in line with the goal of social change, as they are anti-establishment. But they often misapply this scrutiny of our social system to modern science, to the extent that they begin to deny science, the damage this does is immeasurable on at least two significant levels. One being that it discredits TZM as an entity since it becomes associated with a largely scientifically illiterate membership base, and two, this being a more social effect, the effect of science denialism really does result in human and environmental suffering. I'll expand on this point later when I address certain specific issues. So while my choice to address these issues and the way I did it might have caused alienation amongst certain members, and I acknowledge this, we must ask ourselves what is important. TZM is about adhering to a train of thought. Do we compromise our integrity by avoiding addressing certain sensitive issues so that our more pseudo-scientific oriented membership base remains intact? Or do we continually attempt to educate to hopefully improve membership understanding and consequently shed some of our less science-minded advocates? It's a, it's a tough question, but ultimately for long-term success and credibility, I think we need to definitely go with the latter. 
We need to be perceived as an organization that promotes nothing but the best evidence-based understandings that relate to the more science-based, sustainable future we are hoping for. A future which depends on confronting many of these supposedly controversial issues. And while TZM's general train of thought does not really depend on any specific technologies and the scientific evidence underlying them, we often discuss applications of this train of thought, which is supposed to reflect the best evidence available. Should we avoid any of these examples of the train of thought simply because some members will have a problem with it? Or should we simply adhere to the best evidence available and discuss all relevant issues as they relate to a sustainable future? Obviously, I think the latter. With that said, I want to bring on my first guest to discuss the communication side of things, as well as a few other issues. That'll be TZM UK coordinator, James Phillips. James, thanks a lot for coming on and helping me address this very important issue. No problem, Matt. A pleasure, as always. So why don't we start with the whole communication aspect of things. This was one of the main criticisms I got in my talk, and I've already addressed it a little bit, but uh, I'd like to bring on your your expertise on the issue. I've always found that you've got a, a great way of communicating ideas to people, especially emotionally charged ones, in a way that uh, makes them not feel too defensive about uh, having their viewpoints challenged. So why don't you uh, sort of give your take on, on, on the way I've chosen to communicate these, these ideas, how maybe I could have done it better and how we can all move forward with this. Well, I, the two schools of thought on communication that I generally um, come from is general semantics and nonviolent communication, both of which have shown quite a lot of validity in, in how they get through to things. I've gone through those um, in several different radio shows and, and lecture, lectures before, which uh, should be available online. And if not, you can just take a look at those topics because I think they're absolutely valuable for a movement that both seeks to um, uh, uphold science, science and scientific literacy as uh, a way of deciphering the best methods to orientate um, uh, the means to meet human need <coughs> and our social system in general. But to get there, it's very important. And whilst we're there is to communicate in an effective way. And those two methods certainly do hold um, a lot of validity for me. With regards to your talk, I suppose um, and um, I'm sure you would probably agree with this, that, that, that you already felt that it was um, going to cause a stir, um, potentially. Um, that being, being given, I suppose, with the benefit of hindsight, the use of um, derogatory terms and maybe um, a, a, an aggressive approach or direct approach in certain areas of the talk may not have been the optimal um, use of communication strategy considering that some of the people on the other end will will be um, emotionally invested in subjects they've to their best of their knowledge at least they've investigated at great lengths maybe they haven't used the same methods that you outline in the video um, but regardless if you've invested that much time it's ultimately because that person really cares and they're coming from a place where that, that they care about the issue because they have the best possible intentions and I think that's something to try to remember in most conversations or disagreements are usually a product of misunderstanding and forgetting that probably the other person on the other end even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way have the best intentions at heart um, uh, that along with you know trying to see it from the other person's perspective as much as possible are, are all useful tools um, to use in communication. So perhaps um, in this particular instance, that type of communicative approach and um, laying off of terms that could be projected into uh, may may well have helped. I don't think, by the way, just just briefly, that anybody involved in um, any of the the altercations surrounding this issue really disagrees that an understanding of how science works is not um, is not an appropriate. Uh, thing for for the movement essentially I think everybody really agrees on the main um, thrust of the the topic and the the video in general and I, I know I certainly do but um, I think that I'll leave that there because that's more than enough to be getting on with back to you Matt well, I think those are valuable insights and I was teetering the edge of whether to use that strong language or whether not to and I guess hindsight is is 2020 in the sense that I that the the video material was already prone to 
cause some sort of emotional reaction, and I, I suppose I didn't need to uh, use such language in order to pr provoke people even more. But I don't know. That's it's still a it's still a, a tricky issue for me because I like to communicate honestly, and uh, you know, words like like science denier might seem offensive to some, but uh, you know, it's, it's a politically correct word in a sense, and it's, it's accurate in what it defines and that people who hold scientifically indefensible positions are, you know, quite literally rejecting information that, that they don't want to consider for, for whatever reason. Uh, but I guess I'll leave that, that topic there. Um, now we were discussing before how, and you just mentioned it, how people probably generally agree with, uh, the, the the approach that I've outlined in, in terms of how to navigate information, but if they don't, then, you know, what is it that they need to do in order to, you know, criticize the talk in, in terms of the scope uh, and the outline that it provided for how to conduct and how to assess research? Um, yeah, I think that's uh, an important point because personally, uh, when I watched the talk, um, I thought it was, I thought it was great, by the way. And I was personally unaware of many of the techniques outlined in the video. And those some act some of the um, opinions or, or on certain topics expressed challenged my current viewpoint. Considering that I knew that I was unaware of the methods that you're you were talking about before um, actually seeing the video, then I sort of stopped to say, well, I should really explore the validity of this um, these methods further. Um, before just assuming that I've been conducting my own research with the optimal methodology. So I, I certainly would encourage other, others to do the same, because if you weren't familiar with those, those methods that have just been outlined, how can you be absolutely sure that your opinions have been found, are founded soundly over the issue? So um, that, that's, that's the first one, you know, having, um, and if you, if, you have a or if you're aware of the methods that have been outlined and you have a superior one or a superior set or issues with it um, based on some information then I would say first of all let's hear that um, if however you are familiar with the method and you agree with it but you've arrived at different conclusions um, through maybe information that you might not be aware of Matt then then let's hear that information let's hear why you've arrived at the different conclusions so that we can, you know, so that hopefully we would um, make corrections forthwith. Um, other than other than you've either got a different method or you've got a problem with the conclusions that have been arrived at, either through lo a logical fallacy somewhere or faulty information, I can't personally see any other circumstance by how you could rationally criticise the video, uh, other than maybe emotional investment and. Um, and as you know psych psychology issues i suppose where where people can um hold two contra contradicting views at the same time and um maybe stay in denial over a, a particular topic because of an emotional investment in it so um which is 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 a, a science in itself to try to communicate to um to certain people who may be of of that ilk or in that mindset so to speak so that would be my perspective on that topic Fantastic. Thanks, James. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, otherwise, we'll wrap up this segment and move on. Other than, um, other than I think it's Im important for everyone in the movement to focus on an outward um, style of communication. And that that's what essentially I felt you were trying to do with this, this video. You were trying to basically speak to other communities out there outside of us our little sp our sphere of reference that's within just our own personal circle and you were trying to say look you know it, we we are striving to carry out the most rigorous research we can so that we're we, we're not just seen as as flaky or candles floating in the wind who'll go to the the next topic that feels nice and uh, and what have you you know that actually there's some rigorous research going on with this movement and um and it's something that that pe people outside of our movement should take seriously and i think that that uh was a bold step um uh and, and a much needed one so um i would personally commend you for that and say to everybody else look the important thing isn't um it, it isn't necessarily these things it's it's about really making sure at all times you're do you're doing 
your utmost to make sure your vision is outward looking and um, getting out there and spreading the word about this message because it's not exactly like it's common knowledge to most people. All you've got to do is switch on the radio for five minutes to realize that. So, you know, let's stay positive. Um, keep a positive mental attitude and make sure we're communicating in a way that other people can hear what we're saying um, rather than in a way that necessarily we're used to and we think works from maybe our own perspective. Brilliant. Thanks so much, James. I really appreciate your time. No problem, Matt. Real pleasure. My next guest will be Philip Blair of TZM Northern Ireland. I'll just get him on the line here. Thank you, Philip, for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Uh, hello, my name is Philip Blair, and I'm one of the main regional coordinators in Zeitgeist Movement Northern Ireland, and I also help admin the TZM UK Facebook page. And the reason I came to join the Zeitgeist Movement was because from a very young age, I've always been very skeptical of uh, the current economic system, as well as the methods, the methods we use to uh, solve social problems. So, especially where I'm from, because where I'm from in Northern Ireland, um, I've sort of grow, grown up amongst the sort of worst aspects of society, you know, like bigotry and religious division and tribalism. But luckily, I had a relatively secular and apolitical upbringing, so none of that ever really appealed to me. Um, my grandfather sort of taught me the importance of the scientific method and technological advancements. He used to be a big um, admirer of... Uh, NASA and the space program and he basically promoted a, a humanist type of world worldview which essentially consisted of stressing the importance of evidence uh, and reason so you could say that served as the early stages of how I came to identify with uh, TZM so excellent that's very you come from a unique uh, upbringing I think amongst men, uh, amongst our membership uh, so how did you get involved in in the zeitgeist movement then well, I came to be an advocate of Zeitgeist Movement from about 2011. It was basically the day after moving forward, um, which I watched at a public screening in a venue called The Black Box. And I think there was something like 200-odd uh, people in attendance. And I was immediately convinced by the broad train of thought, or at least I was convinced that a radical move away from the current unsustainable economic system was the most progressive step forward. So since then, I've done a lot of my own subsequent research and attempting to arrive at my own conclusion, uh, conclusions, uh, most of which further solidified my agreement with the, um, what the movement basically promotes. And in fact, as a result, I eventually decided to return to college in order to improve my critical thinking and research skills, because I realized that if I were to ever be taken seriously as an activist, or if, if I was... Um, representing the movement as an activist, uh, I would have to become as articulate and rational as I could possibly be. So I studied a uh, humanities module for a year, and now I study philosophy and anthropology at Queen's University, which I think has gone a long way to improve my uh, critical thinking skills. Excellent. That sounds great. So, uh, you know, in our private conversations, you've, you've talked about how, you know, earlier on in your life, maybe a few years ago, or maybe since, since you've been joining uh, the Zeitgeist Movement, you held what you considered to be, uh, you know, more uh, uncritically, uh, uncritical, unskeptical um, beliefs or ideas about uh, certain issues that uh, I, I touched upon in my talk. Uh, do you want to talk about sort of your evolution um, away from some of these these ideas and into a more what you would call skeptical and, and scientifically literate, um, you know, positions? Um, well, I never really went too heavily down the rabbit hole of dogma, but definitely in my early years of first attempting to understand global politics and the inner workings of authoritarian institutions, I did give a certain amount of credibility to ideas, which I now sort of strongly disagree with. Um, I did for a brief period believe in certain conspiracy theories, such as the 9-11 truth movement, and I thought that the 9-11 and architects and engineers were like a legitimate organization with like hard, undeniable scientific evidence. But looking back in hindsight, I can kind of understand how myself and others might arrive at those conclusions because I think a lot of my reasons for buying into those series uh, came from a general distrust of mainstream media coupled with um, recognizing, you know, potential conflict of interests, you know, like, you know, the big weapons contracts for the Iraq war or the um, a lot of the laws that were um, passed post 9-11 that took away quite a lot of freedoms. But 
as always, um, I came to realize that I, th- I think it's important to note that there is a, a very thin line between questioning and being skeptical of certain positions and just choosing not to believe in things and subsequently just subscribing to any convenient alternative that comes along. And that's what you generally tend to find often when people say, you know, they're just asking questions. Like what they really mean is if they've just decided they don't trust or believe a certain position and are trying to find any kind of alternative theories that might validate their suspicions. And I think in a lot of ways, the internet has been an effective generator of this type of thinking because it's kind of a double-edged a double-edged sword because while it's certainly given a platform for people to promote good information which may sort of fall outside mainstream media it's also led to the proliferation of quite a lot of you know dodgy and unscientific ideas um, which co- come under a very thin veneer of being you know, skeptical and anti-establishment so one of the things i quickly noticed from being amongst academics and uh, engaging with people who work in the scientific community is that there's a much more laid back and fair minded um, critical approach that takes into, posi- uh, takes into consideration all sort of possible avenues. But whenever you go on the internet, um, you tend to find that it's usually overzealous and evangelical and people basically cherry picking data and trying to strongly persuade you towards one point of view. Like there's, there's a lot of anti vaxxer and anti GMO videos you watch where they'll just focus on like a few heartbreaking anecdotal cases where like someone's died and they blame it on vaccines or um, you'll see like the infamous picture of the rats with tumors in the Seralini study. And this just has the effect of basically trying to appeal to the emotions and trying to get a reaction rather than actually attempting to rationally analyze information. And this kind of a media has pretty much, it's been an effective recruitment tool for um, very kind of radical ideologies and cults and things of that nature. So in my opinion, what it comes down to is there's often a tendency to kind of com- compartmentalize people um, to the sense where they come susceptible to this kind of thinking. And um, once people kind of get into that subculture uh, and get their suspicions relayed back to them in a very kind of self-confirming way, like it's very difficult to get out of that. And um, even even myself, whenever I changed my opinion on 9-11, for example, like um, I found... Uh, I had a certain amount of cognitive dissonance and I would I actually had like a really strong emotional denialism that I basically bought into these ideas, but eventually I uh, came to and realized I was wrong about them. So. so that brings up an interesting thought on my end is what advice could you offer to people to try to break a lot of the, this cognitive dissonance, uh, you know, that people, people in, encounter when trying to revisit these you know, these ideas that they once believed one thing and, uh, you know, once it, you know, they're presented with, with other evidence that totally conflicts it. Um, do you have any, any tips you could offer? I mean, what, what worked for you? How did you manage to uh, confront these issues and, you know, basically do a 180 on a lot of these, these things? Um, I think there's two main points is uh, never really fully believe in anything. You know, you have to sort of keep open-minded and open to the possibility that you might be wrong. Like, I'm more skeptical of what i think rather than what you know somebody on you know mainstream media thinks uh, i'm more skeptical of like why why do i believe this certain piece of information is this because like that's what the evidence says or because i'm basically engaging in confirmation bias and ultimately once again it's it's understanding uh Scient- it's, it's understanding how the scientific method works. Um, like scientific literacy is important because whether we like it or not, it's the best method we've ever devised. And it attempts to create predictable models of feedback, which are under constant scrutiny and rigorously tested. I, I think it's generally important to point out, like I think you, you mentioned in your video, uh, you, you sort of briefly touched upon how like people who, for example, may buy into certain ideas like uh, the anti-vaccination movement, um, just by virtue of buying into that belief system, that actually opens them up to um, believing other dogmatic ideas, you know, such as like the anti-GMO movement, because just just from being you know susceptible to being wrong about that. But I think the main point in your video that most people bring up as a criticism is that the idea that there are certain monetary incentives that attempt to distort science. But personally, what I've come to realize is that, that pointing out a, a potential conflict of interest is pretty much secondary to understanding uh, what's being said and whether or not the claims actually have like any validity. 
Because, I mean, the key point is, I think that something shouldn't really be automatically rejected based on the fact it was funded by some company. You know, I could point out that global warming hoaxers are primarily funded by uh, big oil interests or advocates of the free market. But a lot of the times conservatives actually point out the exact same thing. Conservative pundits argue that um, Al Gore benefits from uh, promoting the theory of anthropogenic global warming because he directly uh, profiteers off climate and, en and energy policy. So the, the monetary argument, in my opinion, like while it's important to take into consideration, it's kind of a cop out either way, because what matters more is having an understanding of science, being scientifically literate and being able to distinguish good science from bad science instead of putting blind trust in certain organizations or certain experts. So it's kind of like, like, like Carl Sagan says, I, I want to believe or, or sorry, I, I don't want to believe I want to know. So that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think those are great points. And it, it's worth pointing out that, you know, all claims require evidence, including the claims that uh, certain, you know, certain scientific truths or certain ideas that are accepted uh, by scientists uh, are corrupted or, or, or uh, you know, are the victim of conflicts of interest. So if, if you're going to make claims like that, which I tend to think are usually you know, cop out excuses for not doing the research. If you're going to make claims like that, you've got to, you know, provide some good evidence that, uh, you know, an entire, uh, an entire field of study is has been corrupted by monetary interests. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, even just like um, coming back to the the 9/11 architects and engineer. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sort of touch on 9/11 because I know it's kind of a controversial subject, but like. Even whenever you go look at some of the stuff they say, you know, like say for example the the, the buildings, you know, Richard Gage, for example, says the buildings fall at free fall, but that's just blatantly false. I mean, there's there's actually like a scattered debris falling faster than the building, and all that does is you you literally have to take a cursory glance at some pictures or a video, and that you just know that that's an incorrect claim. It, it doesn't matter if he's an expert or what you know what he's saying is incorrect. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And, and this is why we can't take any one organization or any one person as, as an ultimate authority on anything. And I think most of the audience understands this, but we all have our own biases and tend to get caught up in certain ideas to the extent that, you know, we have continued confirmation bias that just tends to reassert these conclusions. So that's, that's why I wanted to do this talk ultimately is, you know, how do we assess the scientific, uh, scientific research claims and, you know, what are the tools? Uh, to do so. So, so thank you very much, Philip, for touching on the many uh, diverse points that you have and, and offering your insight. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And that brings me to my last guest for the show. So with me on the line now, I have Christopher Gray. Christopher, thanks so much for uh, participating in this little talk here. Do you want to introduce yourself for the audience? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Chris. I prefer to go by the name Tenoro. That's the name everybody knows me by. Uh, I'm kind of, sort of, the Louisiana coordinator, but I've somewhat taken a step back from the movement here lately for reasons I'm sure will probably be discussed later on in this conversation. Uh, but uh, officially on record, I'm still the coordinator, though Louisiana is a bit of a dead state. Sure, fair enough. So let's get right into what uh, we're here to talk about today, and that's uh, the importance of, of science literacy and you know as you know the the video I did um, you know created quite the stir um, so you've been someone who's been very passionate about science from within TZM so why don't you discuss I guess in your own words why this is such an important issue and how it relates to uh, you know what the zeitgeist movement's overall interests are uh, yes, I, I am a passionate advocate of science and science literacy and education, and not. And as far as um, the Zeitgeist movement's role in science, I would go beyond saying that it's an important issue, and say that for a lot of us, it's an embarrassment. Uh, that is the reason why I have, um, for the most part, taken a step back from the movement because before I'm willing to go out and represent the movement. Uh, any further to the public. Uh, I'm looking around at my fellow members, presumably supposedly advocating technological solutions to social problems, and I'm seeing an embarrassing degree of science um, illiteracy, if that's even a word. Uh, I'm seeing members promoting 
free energy devices. I'm seeing members promoting, uh, I don't see too terribly many creationists, but I have, by, by way of TZM, bumped into a few uh, creationists. Um, people who, they don't like this term, but uh, sorry, it's a politically correct term. AIDS denialists are members of the Zeitgeist movement. Uh, there are an abundance of anti-vaxxers in the Zeitgeist movement, and I'm I'm sorry, that's an embarrassment, uh, and I'm willing to discuss that in detail, and I'm sure it'll come to that. Sure. So since you bring it up, why why do you think it's such a pervasive phenomenon within TZM? I have two inclinations of, about why it, it exists. The first is maybe the origins of of the film series uh, relate to the topics that that tend to be bunched within a lot of these. Uh, basically science denialism topics. And, and number two is perhaps it's just the nature of being associated with an anti-establishment uh, organization that criticizes the, you know, the socioeconomic system. Or, you know, maybe there's another reason that I haven't uh, really investigated. What, what do you think? I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's an anti-establishment movement to a very large degree. And since science is uh, in part an establishment, then... We attract people who are fundamentally anti-science in addition to being anti-establishment. Uh, my problem with that is that you can't put science on the list with corporate establishments and government establishments because science doesn't operate the same way they do. Uh, and I, I did a blog about this a, a while back called Science the Bias Barrier where I discuss how uh, decisions are made in business and how decisions are made in government and then and I essentially identified where the transmission where the avenues there are to transmit group bias uh, or group biases exist in business and, and government decision making and and to what extent or how science the scientific establishment has structured itself to not be immune to bias but way more resistant to bias, such that it can be what one might call philosophically objective. Very good. And so what would you have to say to people then who, who don't really have this understanding of how the scientific process works in, in, in practice, like how not just theoretically, but how it actually plays out in the real world, you know, even though there are problems. What would you have to say to people who, who just claim, you know, there's no way to determine you know what's what's been corrupted by uh, you know government or corporate interests and and just seem to to almost you know throw their hands up in, in laziness or just frustration because they don't have the tools uh, to know how to evaluate this this type of you know scientific research. What I would say to those people is put up or shut up. Get off the blogs. Get off of YouTube and start talking to the experts who participate in that process, who play roles in that process. I don't, I, I didn't reach my uh, understanding of simply watching videos about how the scientific, uh, uh, the scientific process is supposed to work. I've been on calls with biologists, with paleontologists, with doctors. I've spoken to them myself and asked them, how does this system work? When you submit a paper, what kind of uh, bureaucratic red tape do they put you through? What kind of criticisms do they throw back at you? How do you respond to those criticisms? What is expected of you in the error correcting process uh, that that's a, a part of the scientific process, it's a part of peer review, and they'll break it all down for you. And what you hear from these blogs written by non-experts who usually have something to sell themselves is that uh, scientists have some kind of a collective bias to look out for each other that uh, they're all just they're all trying to earn a paycheck is that money is part of the corruption there too uh, that they're all um, uh, you often hear like Peter Duisberg uh, of the AIDS denialist camp talk about this how scientists are, are just trying to earn their grants um, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the actual the reality of it is so backwards from that uh, I mean, sure, scientists are trying to earn a paycheck, but your results have to go through through peer review and be reviewed by experts who don't care if you get a paycheck or not. They don't care who your investors are. 
uh, they need information to contribute to their projects because they have paychecks of their own to earn and they can't do it with information that only suits you and your bias. That's a good point you bring up about Duisburg and it, it seems to be a common thread amongst people who are whose ideas have been rejected by the scientific community. You know, this, with Seralini and the GMO study, with Wakefield and, uh, you know, the discredited vaccine autism study and many other people who you know, when they have their work peer reviewed and, and rejected, they seem a lot of them, a lot of the times they uh, you'll hear this rhetoric of, well, the scientific community is just not ready for this. And, you know, they they come up with all these types of excuses for why, you know, the the work that they've done is, is legitimate. But, it, you know, scientists, for some reason, are just arrogant and or closed minded or, or you know, have, have you come across this? I'm, I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. I hear it all the time, and it gives me a tumor every time I hear it. Nobody who even remotely understands how the process works would ever say that. No one who has ever sat down and had a, and, and had a comprehensive description of the process to, uh, recited to them would ever say that. That science is closed-minded. No, it isn't. We award Nobel Prizes every year to people who overturn or extend uh, old understandings. Uh, I mean, we we used to believe that uh, schizophrenia. I mean, if you read psychology papers from the 1950s, all of the experts, all of the most reputed experts in psychology, would tell you that schizophrenia was caused by. Uh, there was an antiquated term that you don't see much anymore. Was caused by poor parenting, specifically on the part of the mother. That was known as schizophrenogenic mothering. And then I think it was might have been in 1957 the the first uh, biologically based medicines for schizophrenia started being released, and all of the schizophrenics disappeared from the hospital beds, and the psychologists who up up to that point had been telling parents that we we uh, that we think it's your fault your kid is schizophrenic. Um, you read the papers that came out after that time, and they're like, what have we done? We've been wrong all of this time. We have to change everything. As it turns out, schizophrenic is biological. Um, and then you extend out from there. Uh, <clears throat> we used to think that stress was a primary factor in gastric ulcers. And there was a couple of Australian uh, uh, doctors. Uh, I think there were doctors. They were either doctors or biologists. I forget. Uh, their names escaped me at the moment. They won a Nobel Prize. I think it was in 2005 for discovering a bacteria, and I'm probably going to butcher this name, the bacteria Helicobacter pylori, which turned out to be the culprit for gastric ulcers. Uh, that overturned uh, an understanding that we've held for years and years and years. What people don't understand about the scientific process, or about skeptics in general, the scientific process is a an application of skepticism. And if you've ever had it out with a skeptic who disagrees with you about some point, skeptics are hard to move, but they're not impossible to move. Uh, and if um, I don't, I think you and I may have had it out in a couple of uh, in a couple of disagreeable uh, conversations. I will bend over backwards to tell you what will move me, uh, but that doesn't make me impossible to move. It doesn't make me close-minded. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to rant any further about that. That's the whole deal there. No, those are some great points. And I mentioned that H. pylori case in, in my talk, actually. I think it's a great example. Um, I, I've found some people often tend to go too far with these examples of how science has changed. And they, 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 you know, they hold up as an analogy the fact that, okay, well, we used to think the Earth was flat or, um, you know, we before the germ theory of disease, uh, you know, they, they bring up examples like uh, Semmelweis and how he was, uh, you know, the treatment that he received for his theories. And, and they seem to want to liken those ancient cases to, uh, to how science works today, as though that was a, a relevant analogy. Um, I'm sure you've come across this. What, what would you have to say to this? Is it, is it an appropriate comparison to make? Uh, yeah, you're talking about... Um... Uh, it, that that's a phenomenon that has come to be called Galileo syndrome, and I guarantee you nobody nobody can come up with a legitimate verifiable case from this century. <laughs> they they all point to Semmelweis uh, or Galileo, and sure I have heard certain nameless people in TZM uh, put 
Stanislaw Brzezinski on that list, sorry, I don't consider him a, a verifiable case. He needs to get through peer review first like everybody else. The thing, the thing with uh, Galileo, it wasn't the scientific establishment that decided Galileo. It was the church. It wasn't the scientific establishment that determined the Earth was flat. It was just the, the general ignorance of the time on top of the church. Um, and it wasn't necessarily uh, the scientific establishment that was criticizing Semmelweis. I, I have Semmelweis's book. I've read it. I have a copy of it here on my, uh, here on my computer. Semmelweis had an observation. It was a good observation. But what people don't understand is Semmelweis lived in a period of time before the germ theory of disease. The man was walking around and telling people, uh, telling random people on the street, he and his wife would be on the street, that he would approach random couples and, and tell them, in a society where nobody knew what germs were yet, uh, that if you ever have kids, make sure your doctor washes his hands. They didn't know what to make of this guy. And everybody says that uh, Simon Weiss was thrown, thrown into an insane asylum be, um, because they thought he was crazy. No, his wife put him into, a sane, uh, into an insane asylum because she thought he was crazy. He was behaving crazy. And how he play out in the scientific establishment, as we might call it today, he had another problem. He had a good establishment, uh, or not a good establishment, a good observation. He was noticing that good hygiene improved survivability in the hospital. What he didn't know was why. Because the germ theory disease didn't come out until the 1860s, 20-some-odd uh, years later, and it didn't get pieced together until, um, um, until a doctor named Lister, uh, his first name escapes me, uh, put it together. He read Semmelweis's book later on, and then he read, uh, uh, he read Pasteur's Germ Theory of Disease, and he figured it all out. Um, and that pieced it all. To, that pieced together the puzzle, and we started understanding what uh, understanding what role hygiene uh, played in in germ control. Um, but Semmelweis's problem was was something that um, another scientist. I'm trying to remember her name. Barbara McClintock. Compare Semmelweis to Barbara McClintock. Semmelweis pointed out this observation. And he published a book, and he manually did it to his fellow doctors, which is fine. Uh, that was a very, very, very uh, primitive method of what one might call something a peer review. But he wasn't friendly about it. Uh, Semmelweis was an asshole. He didn't have a complete picture, but he knew he was right. He demanded to be viewed as right. He was very vitriolic of his fellow doctors. He would call them butchers and monsters and murderers. He said, how dare you not wash your hands in a society where nobody knew what germs were yet and nobody understood what role hygiene played in survivability. Uh, but then you have Barbara McClintock. That's a scientist. She published the first papers on transposable elements. She, doing research on certain varieties of, of corn, she found that the genome of an organism, specific elements in the genome of an organism were capable of dislodging themselves and then jumping to another location and reinserting themselves, which, uh, you know, transposable elements became known as jumping genes. She published this paper and everybody was like, what the hell? Is that even possible? That can't be true. It, you, you have to be wrong. And that's the, that's the difficult to, mo uh, to move skepticism coming out. And how did Barbara McClintock respond? Um, okay, whatever, I'm going back to my corn. And she continued publishing papers. Uh, for decades, she published more and more information, more and more evidence, and it mounted over and over. And I think it might have been in the 1980s, I think, somebody finally realized, we need to give her a, a Nobel Prize because she was right all along. And after being awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery, how did she respond? Eh, that's nice, I'm going back to my corn. That's a fucking scientist. <laughs> Those are wonderful examples. Um, a, a couple things I'd add to that are that you brought up Galileo syndrome, and you can rest assured that if if those scientists, or if back then, you know, the, the modern system of peer review applied back then, the sequence of events would have played out very differently. And, and another another thing to keep in mind is that uh, you know back then there wasn't really a scientific consensus against the things that they were trying to 
to prove. There just simply wasn't any evidence. So there was basically just uh, they were, they were just in the dark about all these issues. And you know, once enough evidence surmounted, then the scientific consensus emerges, and um, you know, there, it tends to be accepted by by you know all the the key players to try to use these historical examples to try to prove the point is a total misapplication. I think. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you. They think Galileo syndrome is a mark of authority. If the establishment is collectively criticizing you, then you must be on to something. But that's not how it works. You you need the consensus behind you in order to deter, uh, in order to determine that you're even right, because no one person's authority dest- uh, determines scientific fact. Um, but then they start building that conspiracy behind the wall. Here's how conspiracies uh, are laid out. uh, A conspiracy theory, by definition, is a claim that is presented based on a lack of evidence. And you are attempting to dismiss the need for evidence by claiming some other group is hiding it. So what that means is, even, even if you're correct, even if you're right that group whatever is hiding the evidence, it still doesn't change the fact that what you're trying to tell me is X is true, but I can't prove it. Period. That's where it stops. That's what a conspiracy theory is. But they try to say that uh, because I think I can prove this group is hiding the evidence, that therefore means X is true. Um, No, it doesn't, because I still need to see the content of that evidence uh, in order to prove that something is true. Uh, It's just a a mind-boggling misapplication of reason. That's fantastic. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there because uh, the segment's getting a little long and, and the overall talk's already going to be close to two hours, I think. So thank you very much, Christopher. That was that was uh, really great uh, touching on those topics. If there's any any concluding remarks you'd like to make, let's uh, let's wrap it up. Um, sure. The, the best concluding remark uh, I can possibly make is to tell everybody that the scientific establishment doesn't work the way business and government does. It has a different process. It has a philosophical foundation. Uh, Read uh, Rene Descartes. Read Meditations on First Philosophy. Read Karl Popper and get an understanding of what the foundations of science actually are. Don't start from GMOs and then work out from why the science isn't working with it. No, start from the philosophy and work up to why the science feels that GMOs are perfectly fine or that the vaccines are perfectly safe. Well, they're not perfectly safe. Nothing is perfect. But they're generally safe and they're effective and they're better than leaving you to die of preventable diseases. There's, there's reasoning behind all of that, and it's all verifiable. There's a paper trail, uh, and you don't need to rely on YouTube or blogs. Just learn how the system actually works. Don't, go, uh, don't get your information from blogs written by Joe Nobody or YouTube videos that may or may not have been edited by some by, by somebody with no hint of integrity. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you very much to my guests, James Phillips, Philip Blair, and Christopher Gray for their contributions. I now want to go into some of the objections about the specific content I put forward, uh, meaning the examples I use to illustrate my main points. Perhaps one of the most contentious issues amongst social change activists today is that of genetically modified foods, or GMOs. Vaccines are also still somewhat of a social hot topic with a small but vocal minority of people who are rigid anti-vaccinationists. And there is also a bigger segment that is just very confused about both of these issues, not knowing what to think. I'm somewhat surprised by how much these have been issues amongst a limited portion of TZM members as I only really made one point with respect to GMOs and vaccines specifically. So why don't I clarify that issue and then expand on the whole social controversy of each. In the talk, while discussing the issue of retractions from peer-reviewed scientific journals, I brought up two well-known cases of studies that were published in reputable journals and later retracted. The first was by Gilles Serellini and colleagues, who published a study on rats that alleged a link between GMO food and cancer, and the second was a study by Andrew Wakefield and colleagues, who essentially sparked the fear about the alleged link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Let's start with GMOs. Here's what I said in my talk, quote, In 2012, a paper was published in the journal Food and Chemical Toxicology 
authored by Saralini et al., which allegedly found a relationship between GMO food consumption and the development of tumors in rats. The study made media headlines all over and was heralded as finally the evidence needed to condemn GMO foods as unfit for human consumption. However, the study was met with harsh scrutiny and criticism within the scientific community, including many independent scientists, for the study's fatally flawed methodological design. I won't get into the details here. The study was retracted the next year due to its multitude of problems. However, the news of the study's retraction did not circulate the media anywhere near as much as the original study's publication did and is still used by anti-GMO activists as evidence of GMO foods' negative health effects, despite the hundreds of other pieces of evidence that find no evidence of harm." End quote. So now, I will get into some of the details of why this study was criticized and some of the claims from the anti-GMO side following the retraction of it. The study was met with harsh criticism by loads of people in the scientific community, including many independent scientists, not just Monsanto lobbyists, as some would have you believe. The main criticisms of the study were as follows. The study's sample size was way too small, at 10 rats per group. The study used a particular strain of rat that is prone to developing tumors later in its life. Amazingly, the study didn't have controls and had too many treatments. There was no dose response, so they were just measuring noise, and many others. Other criticisms involved Seralini forcing journalists to sign a non-disclosure agreement about the study until after the press conference was given, which breaks a long tradition in science academia, since generally you want to be as open and transparent as possible and not shield yourself from criticism. So after much correspondence between scientists and the journal, the journal decided to retract the study, Officially, because the conclusions stated in the study were not supportable due to the many methodological problems contained therein. According to the Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines, quote, journal editors should consider retracting a publication if they have clear evidence that the findings are unreliable either as a result of misconduct, example data fabrication, or honest error, example miscalculation or experimental error. End quote. Editor-in-chief of the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal, A. Wallace Hayes, states the reason officially. Quote, to be very clear, it is the entire paper with the claim that there is a definitive link between GMO and cancer that is being retracted. In our analysis, his conclusions cannot be claimed from the data presented in this article. End quote. What was the author Saralini's response to all this criticism? One thing he claimed, which was parroted by some uncritical alternative media, is that Monsanto lobbyists pressured scientists and the journal to retract the paper. There is no evidence of this, just speculation. Monsanto employed scientists did indeed send a letter to the journal criticizing the study, though they did declare their, their conflicts of interest. When you realize that the study was criticized by a multitude of scientists within the industry and outside of it, this claim is simply untenable. Another claim by Seralini was that there was a similar study by Hammond et al. published earlier that has not been retracted. So why should Seralini's be, be retracted? First, this is a tu quoque fallacy, which refers to the attempt to legitimize one's own position by pointing out that others have claimed or acted similarly. Even if this claim uh, about a similar study were true, it would in no way legitimize the Seralini study. It would simply require another look at this other study to see if it also should be retracted. And second, the Hammond study was different in enough ways than the Seralini study to make it a stronger one and one not worthy of retraction. Some key differences were uh, the Hammond study used ex experimental groups of 20 rats rather than 10. The Hammond study ran for 13 weeks instead of two years, which is a point used by anti-GMO activists to discredit the Hammond study. They say that the problems would only ensue after that 90-day period which is why Hammond chose this study length. But that is not true. The strain of rats used in both studies, the Sprague Dolly rats, is very prone to developing tumors later in life, meaning the longer the trial goes on, the more likely the rats will develop tumors. This is why using them in a shorter term trial is more reasonable, since the problems tend not to ensue in this time frame. At the two year time frame, you would just be measuring noise, as Seralini's study measured. Next, the Hammond study had adequate controls, while the Seralini study did not. And lastly, according to Hayes again, the journal editor, 
Uh, overall, the Hammond study, quote, was conducted in general compliance with OECD good laboratory practice guidelines, end quote, something that cannot be said about the Seralini study. Funnily enough, since I gave the talk, the study was republished in another journal with very little modification to the original one. Only some extra raw data was provided and a few other minor additions. The study was published in one of those dubious open access journals with no impact factor and is a journal that is pretty much ignored by the mainstream scientific community. Scientists similarly criticized this republication for addressing essentially none of the key criticisms issued to the original. Now, this might seem boring to some of you, but I thought it addressed the claims for those interested, and so I couldn't be accused of evading the issues. Taking a further step back, an objective look at the entirety of the scientific literature on genetically modified food reveals that this is a subject that has undergone more testing than any other food category out there. Even if the Seralini study were valid, we need to be careful not to fall victim to single study syndrome, as I discussed in my talk. To ensure our views are accurate, we need to consult the peer-reviewed literature in its entirety and see what the evidence says. GMO technology has been around for over 30 years now, with the first foods coming to market in 1996, and now with several thousand studies published in very reputable journals. Perhaps the most recent systematic review and meta-analysis of the literature was a recent study published by Italian authors in a very good journal, Critical Review of Biotechnology which reviewed 1,783 research papers, reviews, relevant opinions, and reports published between 2002 and 2012. The review covered all aspects of biotechnology, such as human health and environmental safety concerns, and concluded, quote, the scientific research conducted so far has not detected any significant hazards directly connected with the use of genetically engineered crops. The strength of the evidence across the entire field has forced a broad scientific consensus among the world's most reputed health and academic societies, such as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Medical Association, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the World Health Organization, Health Canada, the Royal Society of Medicine, and many, many others. The broad consensus is that GMO foods pose no greater risk to human health or the environment than do conventional foods. Now, one of the main claims by those who don't accept the scientific consensus and wide body of evidence is that there exist no independent studies and we cannot be sure about potential conflicts of interest that may have distorted the results of these studies. Let's examine that claim. Of the several thousand studies now published, many of these are independent studies, not tied to the biotechnology sector. And these studies corroborate the industry-funded ones. Now, there might be legitimate cause for concern if all studies in a field are industry-funded, but when many independent studies exist that are in agreement with industry-funded ones, there is little room left for valid dissent. Furthermore, as discussed in my talk, claims about conflicts of interest need to be substantiated and demonstrated that such conflicts have distorted the results. We can't just write off data simply because the people publishing it have financial ties to it, we simply have to consider this as a factor when reviewing the evidence at large. We know from broad ethical reviews of science that the levels of corruption claimed by many are not supportable. I mentioned these studies in my talk, but I will repeat them again here. A meta-analysis in 2009 on scientific misconduct found that roughly 2% of scientists admitted to having fabricated, falsified, or modified data or results at least once in their careers but noted that this was likely a conservative estimate. Furthermore, of the nearly 3,500 research institutions that report to the Office of Research Integrity, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 3% indicate some form of scientific misconduct. Since I've given the talk, there has also been published another study that addresses the concern of how much money does scientific fraud waste? The findings published in the eLife Sciences Journal were, to quote the study, We found that papers retracted due to misconduct accounted for approximately $58 million in direct funding by the NIH between 1992 and 2012, less than 1% of the NIH budget over this period. This sort of study is done often to increase the quality of science and alleviate bias and conflicts of interest. And it has also been done in the biotechnology field. A 2011 study in the Food Policy Journal is summarized as follows, quote, 
In a study involving 94 articles selected through objective criteria, it was found that the existence of either financial or professional conflict of interest was associated to study outcomes that cast genetically modified products in a favorable light. While financial conflict of interest alone did not correlate with research results, a strong correlation or strong association was found between author affiliation to industry and study outcome. So there is no association between financial conflicts of interest and study results, meaning there is no significant relationship between industry funding and the study results, but there is with professional conflicts of interest. The study explains, though, how ultimately this is insignificant as most studies were compositional, meaning they were about determining substantial equivalence. And since it is highly likely that the studies will find this, this association shows up. If you remove these studies, the study's p-value, or measure of significance, shifts towards insignificance. There's much more I can say about this, but this should suffice. We have good evidence all around to show that the GMO literature is fairly homogeneous, including independent funded studies. And we have good evidence that should assuage any fears about financial conflicts of interest. Funnily enough, the most glaring examples of conflicts of interest and dishonesty surrounding GMOs come from the anti-GMO camps, not to mention associations with pseudoscience. Going back to Seralini, he published a book that coincided with the study release. He is also a consultant to a homeopathic pharmaceutical company. And the president of Crygen, the institute Seralini is part of, is a homeopath and acupuncturist, both pseudoscience fields. Crygen has also been caught manipulating the embargo system in order to have articles on their, uh, on their study published without having to go through peer review. To be clear, I'm not for a second claiming that all GMOs are completely fine and without issues. The problem with such a claim is that GMOs are not one thing. The technology can be used to create a drought-resistant crop or to insert, insert vitamin A into a crop to enhance its nutritive value. Each product requires thorough testing before it is considered safe and commercialized. Though no, though no ill health effects have been found, some potential environmental issues can arise, such as the development of, res of resistant weeds due to the use of increased herbicide. These problems can be mitigated, and it is ultimately just an issue of agricultural management practices that I won't go into here as it is far too technical to discuss here. I'll leave it there for the GMO issue. Hopefully that shows you how extensive the research has been for this field, how the claim about conflicts of interest are unsupportable, and how broad the consensus amongst reputable academic organizations is about GMO foods. Dismissing an entire body of literature because of a non-demonstrable claim uh, that conflicts of interest have made the literature unreliable is lazy and irrational. And I haven't even gotten into all the potential benefits of the technology, benefits that directly relate to improving sustainability practices, resource preservation, and environmental output, and as such directly relates to TZM's promotion of a more sustainable society. That's for another talk though. Perhaps I'll write an article about it sometime. Let's go into the vaccine issue now. First, let me repeat what I stated in my talk about vaccines. In 1998, Andrew Wakefield published what was later found to be a fraudulent research paper in leading journal, The Lancet, that alleged a causal link between vaccines and the development of autism. Investigations into the paper revealed undisclosed financial conflicts of interest on the part of Wakefield and dozens of counts of dishonesty and irresponsibility. And the whole ordeal was ultimately labeled an elaborate fraud. A multitude of other research has been performed since then that has failed to reproduce the findings and the autism link to vaccines has now been thoroughly discredited and refuted. Yet anti-vax proponents credulously still peddle this absolute nonsense that vaccines cause autism, ultimately causing a tragic decline in the vaccine rates in the Western world, which were followed by outbreaks of the disease that the vaccines prevent. Now, let me elaborate just a little bit. Wakefield's study was only on 12 children, 10 of whom were autistic, and 8 of whom were thought by their parents to have developed autism after receiving their MMR vaccines. This turned out not to be true. There were no control groups. The paper's conclusion, at least, was honest, stating that a link between MMR and autism was not proved. Yet, immediately after the study's publication, Wakefield called a press conference and announced to the world that MMR vaccines should be stopped because it probably caused autism. Anti-vax groups were all over this and ensuing hysteria meant that vaccination rates plummeted in many areas. Measles rates 
soared, and in 2008, measles rates in the UK were considered endemic. Yet, investigations revealed that Wakefield had acted extremely unethically and unprofessionally, and charged with several accounts of misconduct, and thereby asked to resign from his job. It was found that Wakefield was hired by a lawyer to find evidence to justify suing vaccine manufacturers, and that the children he studied were his lawyer's clients. Wakefield covered up the fact that he was paid over half a million British pounds for the study, not to mention failing to disclose several other conflicts of interest. Medical records were obtained of the children who were studied and were found to already have had autism before the MMR shot, but this was conveniently, conveniently left out of the study. I encourage you to, to all to read up on this for yourselves using multiple reputable sources. Don't just read, uh, don't just review Wakefield's website or anti-vax websites. That wasn't the only scare about vaccines. I didn't cover this in my talk, but there was also the claim that alleged a link between thimerosal, a vaccine preservative that contains mercury, and autism, or other neurologic effects. There was concern about whether thimerosal could cause mercury poison, but thimerosal contains ethyl mercury, not methyl mercury. Ethyl mercury is excreted faster and is considered to be much safer, and there's no evidence of ethyl mercury causing any damage. In fact, a study back in 1929 involved giving subjects 20,000 times the amount of thimerosal children could possibly get from all their vaccines and there were no incidences of mercury poisoning. Despite this lack of evidence, thimerosal was removed from most vaccines in the U.S. due to concerned parents claiming that mercury poisoning was occurring due to this preservative. Autism rates haven't dropped at all since thimerosal was removed from vaccines, even though this was predicted by anti-vaxxers, such as by David Kirby, who wrote the nonsense book Evidence of Harm, which has now been thoroughly discredited. Yet the anti-vaccinationists persist in the face of all the evidence. And like I mentioned in my talk, for which you can find the sources for, rates of many different diseases that vaccines prevent have shot up in the past decade due to this irrational hysteria. It is worth pointing out that we cannot afford to be on the fence about these issues. We can't abstain from having a position either way about vaccines, since you either have to decide to vaccinate your children or yourself, or you decide not to and suffer the consequences. There are countless other socially manufactured controversies about science, where there are profound consequences to our health and the environment, on whether we act for or against. And such an ambivalent position is not only practical, not only not practical, it's not even possible. You, eat, you, you have to either eat or not eat organic foods. You either acknowledge or deny the robustness of the lipid hypothesis and then act on that. And more broadly speaking, you either give credence to scientifically tenable ideas or you reject them and then spread this doubt and misinformation that affects your peers. So my point is, you cannot simply say, quote, I'm, I'm neither pro or anti-vaccine, or, quote, I'm neither pro or anti-GMO. Your actions will dictate that you are upholding one of these two binary positions. And by making statements of ambivalence like that, you are spreading undue confusion, simply because you yourself have not done the due diligence on that particular issue. Hence the point of my talk. We live in a confusing world where reliable information gathering can be intimidating and tricky. Rather than throw our hands up and claim that it's impossible to accurately research these issues due to monetary interests and make claims about corruption and science that are disproportionate to the evidence, let's try to assemble some skills that allow us to wade through the noise and hone in on the best explanations for many of these socially heated issues, issues that directly relate to a more sustainable future. Once again, while these specific issues are not directly related to the foundation of a resource-based economy, understanding these issues is an application of the scientific method, which is the foundation of the social change we're all advocating. And because we're in, uh, we're, and because we're advocating science, it is imperative that we understand how it works, not only in theory, but in practice today. With that said, I do want to offer to anyone who's listening who has a problem with anything I've said, either on behalf of TZM or simply personal remarks that I made, get in contact with me, either through my Facebook page uh, or through my email, mattb at zeitgeistvancouver.com, and send me an email. I'm not closed to information. I simply want to provide and uphold uh, the best available evidence and the positions that is supportable, that are supportable. I want to again thank my guests for coming on this one-off show and helping me clarify a bunch of issues. I'm sure this will not be my last work where I touch on these issues, and my hope is that this has helped inspire many more of you to become active about issues surrounding scientific literacy 
and how this relates to positive social change. Thank you very much for listening, everyone.